some money Then you can be my sweet little honey I'll drink plain soda, you drink your rock and rock We'll be so happy, Donny, you and I Oh, July to July, you are my honey July, July, I'll give you my money July to July, you are my baby July to July, we'll get married, baby Can't drink beer. You can't drink beer in outer space. Can't get that bottle to your lips with a helmet on your face. You'd look as funny as a beaver. We're in zero gravity. Oh, you can't drink beer in outer space. surgeon that would be pretty keen i'd remove gallbladders and kidneys and some spleens but alas it is true that is not a job for me i'll never hold a scalpel you can't drink beer in surgery oh you can't drink beer in surgery don't want your doctor drinking before your appendectomy i must choose a vocation that doesn't deal with Maybe I would be the best All I'd have to do is drive real fast And then I would turn left But I'd be fired in an instant And they wouldn't let me back You can't be a NASCAR driver If you're serving around the track You can't drink beer and drive NASCAR But if you're up in the stands Then you definitely are But you can't be on the bottle When you hit that throttle Oh, you can't drink beer and drive NASCAR You can't have a drunk driving a tank If you want beer on the job You can't be a fireman If you want a drink at work You should have joined a polka band You can't drink beer in outer space Can't get that bottle to your lips With a helmet on your face You'd look as funny as can be Drinking beer in zero gravity No, oh, you can't drink beer in outer space You'd look as funny as can be Drinking beer in zero gravity Oh, you can't drink beer in outer space.
Hi everyone, this is Marianne Vogel and I'm from the Cleveland Curantavania 2021 Festival Planning Committee. I am talking to you from beautiful and cold Cleveland, Ohio. And the Planning Committee is getting ready to welcome you to Cleveland Curantavania 2021 to scare winter away. And what a year that we need to scare winter away. Eh? So I wanted to just in invite you to our festival this year. We have so many wonderful things planned for you this year. That's right, because of the pandemic, we're not able to meet in person, but our planning committee has worked unbelievably hard and they were diligent in creating a wonderful virtual event. Every year, Curentavania just gets bigger and better. And that's no different this year. This year, Curentavania is a global event. We have friends from Canada, Japan, and Slovenia coming this year to be part of Cleveland Curentavania. Uh, of course, we miss having you, and we cannot wait to see you next year in person again. But until then, you need to be part of this year's event. We actually are blessed to have a planning committee that is solely made up of volunteers. Without them, this event would not be possible. But there's something else that we need. And um, in this year of challenge, I do actually hate to ask, but it's, it is necessary. We could really use your donations to help offset this year's costs to create this virtual event and to prepare for Curentavania 2022. There are a few ways that you can make a donation to us and, and to help support the organization. The first way you can help us is if you go to our Cleveland Curentavania website and hit the support link and make a donation. Please buy our merchandise. Wear Curentavania. That would be the best way to advertise what we're doing. And second of all, if you join us in our online events, you'll be able to get a text code where you can make a donation. And lastly, please share the events. Join us on Instagram, join us on Twitter, join us on Facebook, and please share, share, share away. Because we've been growing Curentavania every year. And again, we can't be in person, but that doesn't mean this can't be the biggest and best Curentavania to date. And that's with your help. So friends, help us, join us, scare winter away. When you're at the virtual events, grab a glass of wine, grab a beer, Join us for the concerts and let's have so much fun with the Kurens scaring winter 2021 away and bringing in springtime. Thank you so much for joining us in this week's event. Hvala lepa, nazdravja, and enjoy. Živio, welcome to the ninth annual Cleveland Krentvanya. We're excited about this year's festival and ready to kick off a week of programming, starting with this session entitled Mushrooms, a Slovenian Tradition of Foraging. My name is Nicole kusold Mateo, and I'll be moderating this live session. I want to give a warm welcome to our three presenters and also give a brief overview of this session. M. Kusold, who, yes, is my sibling, uh, is going to start by giving us an introduction on mushroom foraging in North America. Luca Zielnik will be discussing mushroom hunting in the context of Slovenian culture and history. And finally, we'll go on a virtual tour of Miro, Miro Njatic's farm where he cultivates mushrooms. As I mentioned, this is a live session. We're streaming on clevelandkrentvania.com, Facebook Live, and YouTube. If you're on Facebook Live or YouTube, feel free to post your comments and questions in the comments. We have people who are looking for those and will be uh, giving us your questions to answer at the end in our Q&A session. All right. Um, one last thing here. Uh, Cleveland Curentavania is a nonprofit volunteer organized event. All our events are free. I'd like to to ask you to support us um, if you are able to by texting this week to donate current K-U-R-E-N-T 21 to 
44321. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn over the mic to M. Kuzold, who will kick off the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Getting a little bit of an echo. Okay, perfect. Now I think I'm ready. Oh, hello. Um, my name is M. Um, I'm originally from the Cleveland Slovenian community, but I've also lived in Columbus and I now live in Seattle, Washington. Um, I was uh, originally started foraging around five years ago in Columbus um, and have been mostly foraging for the last four-ish years out here in Seattle. So I'm um, hoping to be able to talk to you today about both Ohio and, and um, Seattle, the entirety of the United States as I've, as I've lived it. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about parts of a mushroom foraging basics, cool things you can do with mushrooms that don't involve eating them, and then a couple of basic simple mushrooms that you can start looking for. So, so. In order to start, in getting, order to to know, start getting mushrooms to, know, to identify, mushrooms them, to identify we them, we need to know what the different, what parts, the different are. parts are. So let's go through the, so basic, go through anatomy the basic anatomy of, of, a, mushroom, of, a, of mushroom, a mushroom, of a simple gilled mushroom. Simple gilled mushroom. Um, this can be similar, um, this can be similar to the ones you've seen at the grocery store. store. So, um, so um, at the top part, at the top we part, we have a cap, it's, you know, the little, you know, the little kind of roundish, roundish concave area. And then there you have the stem, also known as the stipe or the stalk, which is the elongated area. And then, um, and then you have, you have these, little little things, these little things, you might see, you might the, little see dots the little dots spores. and they're called spores. Spores, spores are, are the genetic the material, genetic needed, material to needed to make a new fungal organism. organism. Um, so if you um, so want it, you want it, you probably are working like a plant. Like so, a plant. A plant. so in a plant, plants, plants make seeds sometimes, seeds to spread, sometimes to spread, to make new more, to make new more, new plants, and this is sort of the same thing. So spores are spread, are spread to make more fungal organisms, fungal organisms that make mushrooms. And then, and then underneath the cap, we have something called Gills. Something called gills. So in the grocery so store, in the grocery store, these are the kind of mushrooms where, kind of mushrooms if you where brush your hand, you brush your hand under, the cap, under the cap, it sort of makes it's wavy, sort of like an accordion. Sort of like an accordion. Uh, um, um, and that's uh, and the gills are where, uh, the, gills are where the, spores are the spores are made, basically. Basically. Um, and um, and then finally we have uh, the mycelium. So there are these tiny thread-like. Um, they're usually like white, white thread-like things uh, that grow in the soil or underground or on trees. And that's actually the um, that's actually the fungal organism as a whole. So, in order to make another analogy to plants, um, if you have a, an apple tree, um, you have the tree. This is the organism, and it makes little apples, and you pull them off and you eat them. In the same way, a mushroom is like the fruiting body of the mycelium, and so the mycelium grows, and when it wants to reproduce, it makes mushrooms, and then people can pick them and eat them. So, the real fungal organism isn't the mushroom; it's the mycelium growing underground. Um, another thing I want to point out is that uh, not all mushrooms have gills. Uh, some of the mushrooms we'll be looking at today have something called pores instead. Um, and this is like a different way that they produce spores. Uh, and so they're like deep, deep little holes and then the spores are made and fall out of it. Uh, and basically the reason why we're going over this is because when you start to identify mushrooms, um, a lot of the ways that you identify them is by knowing all the differences in colors and smells and textures and tastes between all these kinds of things and even more. So mushrooms, I want to emphasize that mushrooms come in all sorts of different shapes, sizes, colors. Um, not all have gills, not all are soft, not all grow above ground, and some are delicious and some are deadly. So um, here's just a, pic a couple pictures of all the different kind of mushrooms that I found over the years. Uh, some of them are growing, you know, in cities underneath bridges, and some of them are like in the deep woods and that kind of thing. So there really is, um, if, if you've been to the grocery store and seen a mushroom, you definitely haven't seen it all. There's there's a lot more out there, uh, and I just want to emphasize that that there's a lot of variety out there in the mushroom world. So before we can think, even think about eating, I want to go through a couple of things that need to be considered. Uh, the first of which is identification. Um, always be 100% sure of what you're eating, especially if you if you find it outside. Um, if you're not 100% positive, uh, then we'll talk about ways where you can find help to become that positive, but don't eat anything that you don't really know. Um, you have to take your safety into your own hands when you're finding your own food outside. And I encourage everyone, uh, I encourage everyone to go mushroom hunting, but please consult 
experts or local mushroom clubs or it's someone who you trust um, before consuming any mushroom that you're um, uncertain of. And also, if you're eating a new mushroom um, or are new to mushrooms in general, if you find something in the woods and take it home, uh, always make sure to save a little bit. So like you can eat it, but like maybe save like one or like a small slice or something in case in case there's um, an emergency situation where you can give it to a professional to ID. But so I don't want to scare you off. I've never had any issues, <laughs> but but definitely um, please be safe. Another thing to consider is the environment in which they grow. So similar to like plants, you don't want to be, you know, eating uh, lettuce that's been growing in, you know, nuclear waste. And it's the same thing is that you need to pay attention to where things are growing. Um, so something to avoid would be picking mushrooms on the side of the road. Uh, we have a history of having leaded gasoline and uh, mushrooms actually do something called biomagnification, where it not only you know, absorbs, but it actually absorbs at several rates. It's good at sucking up all of the, the heavy metals. Some of them, some of them are good at sucking up all the heavy metals um, more so than, you know, maybe like a plant and things like that, which is really fascinating if we want to talk about like Chernobyl and radioactivity, but we won't right now. <laughs> but anyway, um, try to make sure the environment's clean. Uh, pick somewhere that, that you don't think people are spraying pesticides or um, fertilizers or anything like that. Um, in Seattle, it's nice because it's like illegal to to spray things in the public parks. So I feel pretty good about that. But definitely pay attention in Ohio. And the last thing is permission. Um, there's a it's an, unlike unlike hunting and fishing. The the laws on mushrooming in in the United States are very not put together. They're very patchwork. There's different laws for each each public park or area that you're at. It's going to be something different. Um, and so. Uh, generally, if you want to be sure that, that you're going to be picking legally, I would call ahead to that specific park. Usually the park rangers are really friendly and are really happy to like help you out, especially if you're not doing commercial picking where you're, you know, picking, you know, 50 plus pounds. People are very welcoming. But if you want to make sure that you're not going to get in trouble, I would definitely check with uh, the local local park or wherever you want to go. Or, you know, you could go on private land as well. So another another kind of like way to prepare um when you when you are looking for mushrooms the thing that you're going to want to know is what what mushrooms did you find uh so i would really recommend getting um some guidebooks i have about like four or five guidebooks that i use um the this one mushrooms and other fungi of, of north america i find to be the most beginner friendly it has lots of color photographs and it's really conservative about if anyone's ever felt a little bit queasy off of something, they'll like be like, oh, don't eat this. So there are a lot of other ones that that'll tell you that some of the some of the stuff in this book is edible. But but Roger Phillips, I think, is the most conservative in this book. So if you really want to have a, a safe start, this is a good one. Um, and I also want to say, uh, don't trust the Internet for mushroom identification, specifically like Google Images. If you look up some mushrooms on Google Images, a lot of mushrooms that aren't even close to it pop up. Um, so there are some specialized websites like mushroomexpert.com and later we'll go over some Facebook pages and things like that where people I think are more specific but um, the internet at large is not extremely accurate when it comes to uh, identifying mushrooms so I would really encourage you to get at least one guidebook I, I cross-reference about like two or three when I'm picking something new to make sure that they all line up but um, we'll also talk about how you can find people to help you as well but anyway guidebooks are great this guidebook in particular I really enjoy all right, so before um, we talk about how we can find edible mushrooms, let's explore some non-edible activities that are fun for the whole family. Um, and so before we're talking about spores and how it's the how the mushroom reproduces with them, um, they're, they're also a great way to figure out, to identify the mushroom that you have. Uh, they can be very different. On the right here, we have a particularly weird mushroom called bird's nest that grows in mulch. You can actually find it in, in you know, city mulch around. And they're tiny, tiny mushrooms, and their spores come in these little egg-like packets that when it rains, they fly into the air. But a lot of the times, um, spores will be more like the powder on this little puff ball to the left, um, where it'll just be like sort of a cloud of spores, or it'll like gently drop down from, from the mushroom structure as well. So spores come in different colors. And sometimes when you're IDing, the book will be like, oh, this mushroom has green spores or something like that. And so uh, you can do something called a spore print that's um, first good for IDing, but also like super fun and, and um, nice to see from like an art side. Uh, so basically all you have to do, and you can even do this with a, a grocery store mushroom to start if you want it, or if you have kids, this is a great way to, to sort of include them into mycology 
which is the study of mushrooms. So all you need to do is get your mushroom. Um, if it has like gills like this, you can pop off the little stem and then you put it on uh, a piece of paper or aluminum. So because spores can either be dark or light, you know, um, if you have light spores on white paper, it's going to be harder to see, but sometimes people use aluminum. So you put, um, you put the little paper down, you put your little uh, mushroom cap on it. And then uh, Luca says that he puts like little li liquid in there. I've never tried this, but it sounds good to me. It keeps it a little bit more moist and it drops it more quickly. And then you can put either um, like a little cup on it or you can just leave it be. And then uh, you could leave it for an hour or up to overnight or as long as you really want before the mushroom starts to go bad. And then after a while, if you lift the cap off, you'll see this nice little print underneath that's really beautiful of all the all the gill structures. And then you'll be able to know what, what color things are. Um, and it's also just a fun thing to do with kids to see, um, you know, like what, what, what do spores look like? Uh, another fun non, non edible activity that you can do, um, is finding this mushroom called artist conch. Artist conch is the common name and the Latin name is Ganoderma aplanatum. Uh, Ganoderma means shiny skin and aplanatum means shelf. Um, and if you've ever heard of reishi mushrooms that are getting more popular, these are in the same genus, so they're related. Uh, but this mushroom is a perennial shelf mushroom, which means that it's growing all year, including right now. And you can go out and try to find it. It's super common in Ohio. I see it a lot less out here, but almost every time I went to Ohio forest, I was able to, um, find some artist conchs. It's really tough and woody and grows, um, on dead or dying trees. And in Ohio, I found it exclusively on deciduous trees, but they grow out in conifers too, um, probably more at like West Coast. These are the ones we were talking about pores versus scales. They have pores um, and uh, they drop actually a lot, a lot of, a lot of spores from their pores. Um, and the interesting property about these ones is that you can draw on them. So what you do is you pick it fresh and then basically you can take a little knife or a little pin and then you etch onto it. Um, and then after and then you like let it dry and so once it once it dries you can't etch onto it anymore but it holds the original drawing um and so this is like also a super fun thing to do if you're artistic or you want you know a way to involve kids or it's also a great mushroom that you can um they don't work as well in the winter but i've done them in the winter as you, as you can see i did this in 2017 after curenza vania so around now i think it was less snowy but um you can go outside and try to draw on some artist conks Okay, so now now that we've done a couple of non-edible activities and feeling pretty good about ourselves, um, we can start to look for edible mushrooms. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's called Chicken of the Woods, um, and its Latin name is Lataporus sulfuris, and there's there's other variations. Not all of these are in the exact um, species of sulfuris, but the, they're all generally Chicken of the Woods. And this mushroom is awesome. Um, first of all, you know, it fits in with our Slovenian theme. Slovenia looks like a chicken you know, and this is chicken of the woods. So it's, you know, sort of on theme here. Um, and the cool thing about these mushrooms is that they have like the taste and texture that almost exactly match cooked chicken. Uh, so like literally when you pull it apart, it has like the muscly sinews and, but it's not chicken. So you don't have to um, worry about eating meat if you don't want to. And that's also, you know, a cheap way to get some chicken. These mushrooms, you can identify them because they are bright yellow and orange, right? Almost impossible to miss. Um, they grow off of, uh, you know, dead or dying trees. They, um, let's see, they have an underside that's like bright yellow, um, and they have pores again, like our artist conch, they don't have gills, they have pores. Um, the spores that come from their pores are white uh, and they, when they're like wet, they're a little bit, you know, they're a little bit like rubbery, like a, sort of like a rubber chicken, you know, you like, like wiggle it around and it's, it's, it's sort of like that. Um, uh, let's see, the, they can grow on deciduous and um, conifer trees. Some common ones you can find on are like oak, beech, yew, willow, cherry, chestnut. Um, and these can be found from late summer to fall. So this is more of like a fall mushroom you can look for. Um, uh, Luca, Luca asked me to remind y'all that it does not have gills and it does not grow on the ground. So there's some common times where people are like, is this this? And it's like, if it's not, if it has gills and it grows on the ground, it's not, it's not chicken of the woods. But if it's bright orange and looks like this and is in the middle of a tree, um, then, then you're in business. These are some I found out west. These probably not, are not <laughs> the sulfurous, but I 
I didn't bother to identify the exact species, but they still taste like chicken and they're still awesome. They don't really have any lookalikes. Um, again, always make sure you're positive what you're IDing, but these are a really good st place to start for a beginner because they're almost impossible to mess up. Um, let's see. And you also want to get them young. So what can you do with them? You can make chicken of the nugget. Um, so basically when my partner and I find it, we really like to make chicken nuggets out of them and we just cut them into little strips and then bread them and fry them and, you know, dip them in our favorite sauces. And this is like another mushroom where people are like, oh, I don't like mushrooms because I've, you know, like I've tasted the ones at the grocery store. These don't taste anything like the ones at the grocery store. All right. These are, <laughs> these are completely different. So I would encourage you if you're looking to, to be adventurous in your, in your taste to try chicken of the woods uh, and try, go out and try finding it with, with your family or if you're walking out there, um, they're very easy to see because they are bright orange. Another mushroom I want to introduce you to is um, called pheasant back or dryad saddle. Uh, so that's Seraporus squamosus. Ser refers to the Latin word for honeycomb, um, which you can remember because it has this really angular pores on the underside. So if you see, it sort of looks almost like honeycomb-ish. And then porous, seraporus, um, it's a pored mushroom, not a gild. And then squamosus refers to sort of like these scales on it. So people call it pheasant back because it's sort of, I have a little picture of, to be on our bird mushroom theme, I have a little picture of this pheasant up in the left corner and it sort of looks like the back of a, of a pheasant. Um, this is a mushroom that, does not grow in the Pacific Northwest. However, it grows a lot in Ohio. Um, stumble upon it and you'll be able to identify it because there's not really any lookalikes. Um, they fruit in the spring and summer. So once you do your ours conch in the winter and the spring comes, you can go look for pheasant back. And then after summer, you could go look for your chicken of the woods. Um, but these basically uh, fruit on dead and dying hardwood trees like elm and oak and ash. I know we have emerald ash borer still happening, so sad for the ash trees, but you might get some pheasant back out of it. Um, they're fleshy, and basically the, the most unique thing, you'll really be able to tell it's a pheasant back, is because they smell like a watermelon rind. So if you cut into it, it'll smell like literally watermelon rind. Um, and let's see, what else? For eating them, you want younger specimens. So people might be like, oh my God, look at this huge pheasant back I found. It's actually like not that exciting because the bigger they get, the tougher they get. So you really want like the young little guys that are still like uh, not as hard and not as rough. But basically um, you can eat them a, a couple of ways. You can use a, a mandolin to shave them into thin pieces and then you can pickle them and they taste like good as pickles. Uh, you can also use them for stock. I like making them with ramen stock. So when I go backpacking, uh, uh, this is one time where I found some pheasant back and we had like the little merchant ramen packets, which aren't that glamorous. But once you start adding some of your forage goodies to it, it actually really, it makes the flavor a lot better. Um, so I really like these as sort of a, a broth pick me up and another great mushroom that has, uh, n no real lookalikes, but again, do your homework. Um, but it's a very, very easy beginner mushroom to identify. So, um, Another, the one last thing I wanted to mention before I pass off the mic is um, there are a lot of really, really great mushroom clubs and mushroom clubs are a really good place to, a safe place to start and they're very beginner friendly. Um, a lot of them hold these gatherings called forays where people walk in the woods and you as a beginner can walk alongside the experts and they'll help point things out and help identify things for you. And Sometimes even out in Washington, they like give you spots um, of where you can find like chanterelles and stuff. So uh, it's a good deal in America where, 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 where everyone's very sharing. Um, there's this group in Cleveland called the Ohio Mushroom Society. I've never gotten to go, but one time I almost went um, and, and they were having like mushroom beer events. So they seem like they're a riot. Um, there's a, a, a nice club called the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Um, they're in out in Pittsburgh. I've been to um, one of their presentations and they are sort of like in my opinion one of the bigger clubs in the area so that you can get some like good sort of more famous speakers um and they have amazing amazing people there who uh, are developing new resources and talks and they make really good food <laughs> i would go for the food it was really amazing and then um since we're living in COVID era uh the club i'm a part of is the puget sound mycological society um, this is out in Seattle. It's the biggest mushroom club in America. And, but right now you can also attend the lectures because everything's online. 
So I don't know, take advantage of that because we get, you know, so, some of the, some of the greatest people, because, you know, we have a lot of people and we have bigger budget to get, you know, all the, all the good speakers. Another, so those are, those are some, some mushroom clubs um, that I would recommend both in and outside of COVID. Um, some other resources that aren't mushroom clubs. Um, there's this, this guy, Adam Harrington, that I really respect. Uh, he has this website and YouTube series called Learn Your Land where he goes into a lot of details and he like actually reads research papers. So especially if you're interested in like things like medicinal mushrooms, I would really trust him because he's doing, he's reading through a lot of the scientific papers um, that a lot of the other people I've seen online per perhaps are not. So Adam Harrington is great. And he also talks about a lot of like common mushrooms and things like that. Um, there's this Facebook page that I really enjoyed when I live in Ohio called the Ohio Mushroom Enthusiasts. Uh, they were a really active group. I think like it's probably like the, where most of the mushroomers in Ohio end up is on this Facebook page. Um, and there were some really good ideas that would help, um, point you in the right direction. Again, like I wouldn't just blanket trust someone on the internet who's like, this mushroom is this, but it can help. Um, if someone's like, it might be this mushroom, then you can go in your ID book and like validate for yourself. So it's a great way to, to get led in the right direction. Um, so that you can end up IDing quicker perhaps, or especially if you're a beginner, I like to scan it to see what other people are finding. So I'm like, Oh, other people are finding morels. It's time for me to get outside, you know, things like that. Um, and then there's this other Facebook page that, that Luca really recommends um, called Poisons Help Emergency Identification for Mushrooms and Plants. Uh, this is only if you're in like a, a, a dangerous scenario, like, oh my, a lot of them are like, my dog ate this mushroom and I'm afraid it's going to die. And then like one of these uh, like pros will like ID it immediately. This isn't sort of like a, oh, I found this on my walk. What is it? But like, if there's a dangerous situation, these, these folks will really help you out. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to encourage y'all to um, go mushroom hunting. There's a lot of amazing things out there and mushrooms will really blow your mind. Um, and, and there's a lot of amazing different flavors out there. Anything from like fish tasting to deep hearty duck fat tasting to chicken tasting. So it's amazing. Um, thank you for your time and I'll pass it off to Luca then. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Luka Zibelnik, as it was told, uh, and I will tell you a little bit about the difference between the uh, mushroom forging in the United States or, or culture of mushroom forging in the United States and in Slovenia. When I was first asked to do something about mushrooms, I said, yes, of course, this is going to be an int introduction into foraging and some light identification. Basically, what my colleague just presented so great. Then I was told I need to talk about the cultural aspect of mushrooms and foraging, and it dawned on me. There's, there are some differences, but how many? I've seen them, I've, I've experienced them many times, never thinking about them more than just for a moment. And more or less, I shrugged and said, well, I'm coming from a different culture and everybody peaks there. I found my first mushroom, which was Boletus edulis, so porcini, outside of a restaurant in the woods near Ljubljana. As I was five years old, I was playing outside, saw a relatively small porcini near a wooden path, ran inside to get my parents shouting, I saw Jurček, which is the common name for porcini in Slovenian language. They at first didn't believe me, but then they went and checked, and it truly was. We spent a few hours looking for more, because when there's one mushroom, it's usually more, but there were none. What that means was that I knew what the mushroom looked like. I knew the name and identified it at five years old properly. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm some kind of super child, but I was forging with my parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts way, way earlier. That's the first difference. Forging is a national pastime in Slovenia. You learn it with your family, your friends throughout years and years of strolling through the woods and uh, in a uh, social distance way more than six feet because you're searching for your own uh, mushrooms. And due to the fact that so many people do it, the culture is completely different. You, we have laws that you can only pick under 4.4 pounds per person. Uh, but at the same time, you can pick it almost anywhere. Uh, even on the private property that's not yours. Uh, mushrooms, berries, herbs and everything else are public good in Slovenia. The only exceptions are inner parts of national parks, uh, which are protected some some other parks, but not not many. And that you have to clean the mushrooms while in the woods, carry them in an appropriate bag. So mesh bag or a or a, a wicker basket so they can release spores. So it would be spore distribution. 
managed by humans. And obviously, you must not pick mushrooms which are on the red list. So red list would be critically endangered species. Those include about over 100, uh, 111 edible and inedible species, including, uh, for those of you who know more about mushrooms, Amanita cesarea, so in USA it's Amanita jacksoni, uh, which is an insanely good mushroom, Griffola frondosa, which is hen of the woods, which is one of my favorite mushrooms in the United States, a few bullets and some species of heritium, which are, we are going to hear about more uh, with Miro. Mostly it is easy to avoid picking those as you simply are unable to find them usually. Foraging is such a common art there that the people will keep their honey holes, so where they found, find the mushrooms to themselves. Maybe they will tell others where, I mean, in which woods, in which, uh, in which area maybe they found them, but they will never give you their honey hole. They will never, never give you the exact location. You will receive the fruits, the mushrooms as gifts, whether fresh or dry, but never ever the location. Um, throughout centuries, forging of the mushrooms was not just the pastime. Uh, many families have done that to earn extra income, but by selling them uh, in the times of needs even more during the First World War, it was extremely, extremely necessary to get uh, mushrooms uh, and they sell it on open market still today. You can still buy them. People who don't know how to do that or, or, or have less time, less free time, uh, they will buy them there. My next question in order to show a little bit about the culture was, can I trace these things a little bit into the past? What, what is the history of foraging? What is the history of mycology in Slovenia? Uh, where and when do mushrooms come into the literature, newspapers, cookbooks and so on? So I, I dug myself into, into literature and I found that the first mention of the use of the mushrooms in Slovenian lands was done by Paolo Santonino in 1485 as he was accompanying a, a patriarch of Aquileia when they visited Drausko Polje, so that's northeastern part of Slovenia. And the 10th course of, of not the last, but the 10th course uh, was Porcini Frittara. And he writes that you could tell that it was not the ordinary Porcini that they usually eat, that it was something special. Most likely it was just a different species or maybe even a different mushroom. Um, the first time that Slovenian language mentions Goba is in Bible and in, in, the, in the translations of the Bible. Uh, and it's not necessarily so much connected with mushroom. It's, it, it, is, it is in the word Gobavet, so the leper or Gobavas leprosy, uh, where the etymological reason is that the wounds were looking like, like rotting mushrooms. And we have them all, all in 16th century in the religious books constantly in there. Uh, but then we get into this, okay, these are mushrooms. In the first book that we can find uh, in Slovenian lands that mushrooms were, 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 were mentioned, it was a printed book uh, in 1687 and adds uh, about like 10 or 12 different species, uh, talks about extracts, baths, not so much about ingestion uh, or, or, or food. First mention then of Slovenian names for different mushrooms was in uh, 1601 in Codex Clusi from the author uh, Carolus Clusius. Uh, and this is an extremely important thing because he was one of the first mycologists in Europe who wrote an illustrated index of mushrooms uh, he found in Pannonia and Austria, so basically in Hungary and Austria. But the, the thing is that he included some of the words that we use that are common words for, for certain mushrooms, including morels and, and, and russulas and some other. Um, the next mention of Slovenian names, which is even more important, was in 18th century by bota botanist uh, Giovanni Antonio Scopoli in 1760. So that was already in a book called Flora Carniolica, so the, the flora of the Carniolia, which was a part of Slovenian lands. And he's considered as, uh, as an undisputed father of the Slovenian floral and mycological taxonomy. And he was connected with uh, Carl Linnaeus, who we know that is a father of taxonomy around the world. 
After that, the names of the mushrooms were mostly used in cookbooks. So we know that we can eat some. And in the first Slovenian cookbook uh, in, uh, in 1799 by, uh, by Valentin Vodnik, uh, he mentions already two different ones. So he, he mentions morels and he mentions the agaricus, which you more know as, as a button mushroom. Um, so even though his, his taste was pretty rich, I guess he didn't really like mushrooms uh, because he only says about two of them. Um, in Mushrooms were so, so uh, ingrained in the Slovenian society that we have books about laws and orders to different, uh, to different medical personnel um, in, seven, uh, in 1817 already saying what should they do if somebody is poisoned by mushrooms. Of course, they do it in the wrong way. They say all sorts of things wrong, <laughs> including drinking uh, black coffee and such things. Uh, I have to again say, you should obviously seek help from a doctor immediately, not from not not drink black coffee if something like that happens. So uh, the mentions of the mushrooms then were often present in literature, a lot a lot in folk poetry, where we are seeing these common names for mushrooms, and poetry is teaching uh, Slovenians which ones are okay to eat and which one not. Also, many times, uh, Amanita muscaria, uh, so so the fly uh, fly agaric, is is used in opposition to uh, to uh, porcini, because Amanita muscaria is beautiful and red and it has these uh, white dots on it, and and they use it as a metaphor. Uh, usually, mother talks to her daughter. Oh yeah, you can see. Uh, you can see people as that. So some are flashy and I don't know what, and they are all loud and the other ones are, are more unassuming and you should go with those because they're usually better and edible like mushrooms. Not not people edible, obviously mushrooms edible, yeah? Uh, already in the next few cookbooks, we have many different meals, including truffles, uh, which are also found in Slovenia. During the World War One, as I mentioned before, people were trying to get more mushrooms onto Slovenian plates and the identification becomes more in depth, but also the warnings about the poisonous ones. And uh, this connects very much into the 1920s, uh, where we have already a full array of, of uh, over 40 uh, edible ones, including the proper identification of the inedible or poisonous mushrooms with identifications. This was done by uh, by Professor Ante Beck, and he used uh, he used this knowledge of the foreign contemporaries and added Slovenian mushrooms, and this opened a Pandora box for mushroom enthusiasts. Uh, the true mycological section, though, the true myco mycology was established in 1960 at the University of Ljubljana, which immediately was uh, done. Then uh, they had an exhibit of mushrooms at the at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, so the Filozofska Fakulteta at the University of Ljubljana. This, uh, this group still exists. They are renamed a couple of times, but now they're Mycological Society of Slovenia, and they are responsible for majority of the mushroom lists, identification, education, and uh, numerous articles, books, laws, and so on about the fungi. fungi. So Slovenian language shows that mushrooms had a much bigger importance in the past than today. Masculine names in Slovenian, uh, so in the common names of, of, of the mushrooms have the same declensions like living things, like animals, animals, or they are even personified. So Porcini, Boleto Sedulis is Jurčak, little George. And this is because some researchers believe that it happened, uh, that, that this happened because, because if you said the right name of the mushroom, you wouldn't find it. That's one of the explanations. I don't know if it's, it's right or not. Folklore itself has deep connections with mushrooms in Slovenia as well, especially the Fomus formentarius, which is a polyphore that grows on trees and looks like a hoof. In the past, it was definitely used more as, 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 as now as tinder. In English, common name, it is also name, named tin, tinder fungus, and in Slovenian, it's flint mushroom. People took their pores away, dried it, flattened it uh, into this leathery type of material, which was great for tinder and it burned extremely slow. So it just kindled a tiny bit. 
and they used it for transporting the fire, which you know that in the time where they didn't have like lighters or something like that, that was extremely important. And that is still used in nowadays for blessing of the houses before or near Easter. In prior times, in the olden times, it happened closer to Kresna North, so the bonfire night on 23rd of June, obviously right around the summer solstice. So it's a very pagan uh, tradition. In the last centuries, now it's this blessed fire that is burned in, 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 uh, in front of the church. It's taken by boys uh, and they take it to different houses and clip it into the fireplaces around the villages. So the fire is blessed by the mushroom. And uh, for a certain time, it was you couldn't cook on the fire if it was not that inside on that particular Saturday before the Easter. So about the differences, there are many uh, immigrants who came into the USA mo mostly, I mean, thought they knew mushrooms from from uh, from from Slovenia or from all the uh, European lands that they came from. And you can see that in lots of newspaper articles in, from the 1900s that are talking about the poisoning of the mushrooms. It, it, there, there are multiple ones that are talking about, I don't know, 17 people got poisoned, this and that family got poisoned. It happened so often that, uh, it happened so often that the, uh, some, even some advertisements for completely different things, so for, for some bitters, uh, bitter tonics, uh, uh, popular bitter tonics from Chicago, were advertised as a great way to get rid of poisoning. It was laxative, basically. Um, it, but that was done only in Slovenian language. When I searched for these ads in English language, because it was an American, uh, American company that made them, there was no mention of mushrooms at all. So it was important for those immigrants as well. I anticipate that many of the newer generations never learned that from their parents and grandparents because of that because of that fear but there were still thought that fear so that they can be poisonous which can be true and it was said before and i'll say it again never eat a forage, mu forage mushroom if you are not 100 percent sure that it's edible however this fear also meant that the majority of the people don't know the intricacy that was talked about before of different tastes of nuttiness to of, of from nuttiness to 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 uh, I don't know seafood even different textures from from meaty uh, to soft to to, to brittle um, to different uses in cuisine and 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 even teas some people do it uh, they just say I don't like mushrooms I mean and that's that's it I I don't like mushrooms and and, and uh, oh uh, the, it's it's over um, and. I do hope that after this talk, this changes. Um, I do hope that some, some people start to pick it and um, I will be glad to help anybody who I know, obviously, uh, uh, to, to determine or to identify uh, mushrooms if, if we are going together. Thank you. I am Miro Gnatic and I started with this hobby maybe six years ago, accidentally, and just fell in love with mushrooms and growing them. Um, long story short, I ended up buying one of these blocks and wanted to figure out how to make same blocks. And right now I'm, I'm growing maybe 10 different kinds and currently four different kinds but usually it's a little more in the summertime so what we have here is uh, agar culture and liquid culture these two we're going to talk about a little bit later so mushroom gets introduced to, to this agar and basically eats the material around the agar. So agar is basically uh, algae that grows somewhere in California. It gets dried out and we, we mix it with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of compound the mushroom grows on. And when that mixture gets into the, onto this plate, mushroom basically eats it. That's why this plate is white. 
Uh, similar things happen with the liquid culture. The only thing is it's liquid. Now you guys might ask, how come mushroom can grow on liquid? It, it can. In reality, you see all this is liquid, but there's a little bit of sugar, different types of sugar. I usually use honey. And basically that's why mushroom thrives on that. So how do they breathe through this? That's very important. There's a very small micropores on these plates that mushroom can breathe and they don't need tr truly, they don't need much. And on this jar, I created a little filter patch that they can breathe through. Of course, contamination can happen on these and it's really important to keep everything sterile. As you see my hands, they, I put the gloves on my hands all the time while I do this type of work. And also alcohol gets used often on this table. So basically every time I do this type of work, I do it on this table, on this surface, be because it's easy to clean. And this machine gets turned on. This is HEPA filter that, that is really important in this process. I usually turn it on prior, maybe an hour, maybe more before I do this type of work. And in front of the flow hood, all work needs to be clean. So gloves goes on, I put my mask on, uh, and a lot of alcohol is used because any little contamination to these bags will get bags contaminated. At that point, I do the transfer with spawn. I take a certain amount of spawn into each bag to populate it with mushrooms. And then we close the bags, leave it on shelf, and after 10 to 14 days, bags should be ready to fruit mushrooms. So now spawn, we're going to use to inoculate the bags with. So these bags that you see behind me, all these, are already spawned or inoculated prior. Some of these are inoculated maybe a week ago and some of these are like two weeks ago. The difference is that mushroom already ate the substrate, like those on, on the very top. That's why they're so white and they are ready to produce mushrooms. So now we're in a fruiting chamber. As you can see, there's some mushrooms here. I'll be really short and brief. The ones you see over there, the biggest volume of mushroom is, we call it first flush. So you're gonna get the biggest volume out of that flush. This is also first flush, but these mushrooms are baby. Second flush is this. So these are King Blue Oysters, and you do not get as much as the first flush. Reason being because the food of mushrooms is getting used by mushroom. Yeah, this, this taken me by surprise by all means. I started going to the woods and being interested about mushrooms and all of a sudden I developed this love that it took me in totally different directions. Thank you guys so much for that. Em, Luca, Miro, that was phenomenal. Um, we're all, we've got a lot of posit really positive comments coming in on Facebook and YouTube channels here. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into some of the Q&A that we have here. So one of the first questions that we have, Luca, this came when you were speaking. Um, this is from Mary on Facebook. Are there different types of porcini mushrooms and second follow-up question here, are the ones from Slovenia the same as the ones you get in the States? So, so Porcini is a common name. So we, we were talking about the, the Boletus edulis a little bit earlier. Boletus edulis does have variations, many different variations that are named then 
porcini as well. Some some people say to some other bullets that are also porcini, like like the uh, lilac bullet or something like that, in the United States. So uh, sometimes, yeah, I mean, you you can have uh, summer bullets or 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 or, or uh, I don't know autumn bullets or something like that, and they have different caps, but they are still in the bulletus edulis edulis family. So yes, you can get different kinds. Great, thanks. And we have a couple of other questions that we have here. Um, Miro, how did you go from being interested in mushrooms to developing what appears to be a full-on lab? How, how did that happen? I wish I have an answer for you. That, that developed throughout maybe the last four or five years. Um, I was just uh, living in a small apartment. I bought a couple of kits, and I was interested how actually go more than those kits. Because when you have those kits, you just let them be on your counter. So my question was, how do I produce this kit? So I did that, and I had, um, they call them little Mar Martha Stewart um, greenhouses. So I had a couple of those in my apartment. I would fill them with maybe 10, 12 blocks and had like a little operation in my apartment. And when me and my wife, we bought a house, then things started being bigger. And here we are. Very cool. Uh, M, can I find Portabella's and other grocery store mushrooms outside in North America? Great question. Great question. Um, not really. So the grocery store mushrooms, the Latin name is Agarica spice forest. And it's actually like, we, you know, like how there's some animals that we've like turned into farm animals that like can't really survive outside. It's sort of like that where we're like, we've developed the, the strain in such a weird way that, that you don't really find them outside anymore. Um, Another interesting thing to know about those kinds of mushrooms is um, not a lot of people know this, but button mushrooms, uh, so like white button, brown button, baby bella, um, and portabella, these are all actually the same mushroom. These are all agaricus by sporus, but it's just like whether or not it's small or big or whether or not it happens to be brown or white. So just letting you know that those are all the same mushroom. Um, and they really are only cultivated at this point. I'm sure at some point, you know, we found it outside, but it's not something that you can really go looking for anymore. Uh, I, I would add something. There are agaricus that are very similar to that that you can still find in Ohio. Um, um, and and you you basically need to do a spore print to know to know whether it is okay or not. But otherwise, um, some of them are similar, not not the same at all, but similar. Yeah. All right, we've got another one here. Do you think I'd be able to find truffles in Ohio? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, uh, they, they can be found. Maybe Em can tell a little bit more about that. They can be found in north northwest of, uh, of the United States, but not, not near Ohio. Yeah, unfortunately, if you want truffles in America, you're going to have to come out here. Um, there is the Oregon white truffle, and that grows around... Um, around Washington and, and Oregon, and basically, you you know, it's easiest if you get a dog, and there's even people out here um, in connection with the, the Puget Sound Mycological Society, they'll help you train your dog for you, and, and it's a whole, like, sub subculture and subculture, uh, but you can come out here and take your dog and, and try to find it, um, but no pigs, no pigs allowed, because um, they, they root up the land, and so they've been banned. Uh, here and in like Italy and all that, like you're not really allowed to truffle hunt with pigs anymore because they they're too destructive. We have a comment from Susan on on Facebook. Um, she says, when we visited Slovenia, a guide took us to a village in Croatia, as he thought they had the best truffles. Is this something that you guys have heard of as well? I mean, I mean. Uh, all the region, it, 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 mushrooms are not considered uh, with borders. Uh, so the whole region, north, north, uh, north part of uh, uh, Italy, I don't know, south part of France, uh, the, the coastal part of Slovenia, the Istrian part of Croatia, 
they all have uh, black and white uh, truffles and they are all very good. But yeah, I, I've eaten Croatian truffles and they are, they are like truffles, they're very good. And I know there's a feud. There's a feud between the Americans and the Europeans over who has the better like truffles. And so, you know, like the Italians are all like, our truffles are the best. And then people in Oregon are like, our truffles are good too. But, you know, they're just, you haven't, they haven't like, um, there's not as much of a food culture in America. So I think that they're like less popular in general. But there is some argument of like, who has the better truffle? And it's probably just like, who has the best wine? You know, it depends on, it depends on your, <laughs> it's just your opinion, really. Here's a question for all of you guys. What are your favorite mushrooms and why? Let's start with Miro. I think we're having a bit of an audio issue. Let's go to Michelle. Michelle, what's your favorite mushroom and why? We'll come back to Miro. Cool. Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, uh, for beauty, I like uh, the most beautiful mushroom, I think, is Lactarius indigo. There was like a brief shot on one of my slides, but it's like bright blue um, and it's actually edible. We ate one. <laughs> it's like fair. It's not the most amazing mushroom, but it was pretty good. Um, and then for eating, I really like both chicken of the woods and, and morels. Morels are like, I didn't touch on them because they're a little bit harder to find. Um, but out here after forest fires, um, they come up like in the hundreds of pounds all at once. And so I track where forest fires happen and then I go out and pick those. And th those are sort of my favorite. Um, and yeah, and there's, there's a, that's hard to pick, but I think for beauty and for eating, those are my, my two. How about you, Luca? Okay, yeah, my, my, mine would definitely, for eating part, would be Amanita Jacksoni. That's definitely, or Amanita Cesarea in Slovenia, but I said it's on the red list in Slovenia. But uh, Amanita Jacksoni is fairly rare, so when you find it, it's maybe even that part of, oh, I found it. Uh, but it has a very good taste. Uh, taste, uh, And I would say the most broadly used uh, mushroom that I use at home for anything, including, I don't know, beef stroganoff and all the rest of the things, would be Grifola frondosa, so that would be Hen of the Woods. And then uh, a very, I, 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 I like so many mushrooms, I can't really pick, but a very uh, important mushroom or very good mushroom to me is, uh, is the Sparasis crispa, uh, so the, the cauliflower mushroom which has amazing amount of different uses uh, that you can use it instead of the, uh, I don't know, uh, pasta, basically. You, you make mushrooms with mushrooms uh, for, instead of pasta and so on. I mean, I like Herizium, obviously, uh, the best in the winter uh, because I get fresh from Miro. <laughs> so, Miro, what's your favorite? I'm thinking of the same, Luca. Uh, my take or hen of the woods is probably one of my favorite and, and taste is just amazing. And I do eat a lot of heritium or lion's mane because I grow it. Um, in regards to wild mushrooms, I would go for beautiness with chicken of the woods and especially sulfureus, not cincinnatus, because there are two different kinds. I think it, previously in presentation, they were, uh, they were shown two pictures and the one that is more reddish with uh, with a whitish side, that's Cincinnatus, if I'm not mistaken, Luca. And uh, Sulfureus is uh, the one that has sulfurish and greenish color and hue. And that one is amazing to me, especially when you find it in the woods and smell of it is just, I love it. Thanks, guys. We've got another question from Ursi on Facebook. She says, with some mushrooms being very meaty in taste and consistency, is it popular to pair certain wines with each mushroom? And do you have any examples of good pairings between mushrooms and wines? You, can you guys think of any? The, the, one the, the one thing that I would say is that uh, when you start picking mushrooms, obviously you start picking easy mushrooms. So they, they, are, not, they are not that... Um, uh, that dangerous to, to pair with alcohol, but there are some mushrooms that are not really good with alcohol. Uh, they can make you sick. So uh, some of the inky uh, inky mushrooms will will definitely they will always say don't don't drink with uh, with that. But uh, regarding cooking and wine, if I make a if I make a sauce or something, I would use uh, some dry uh, dry white wine 
for the sauce um, of the mushrooms with it. But drink red wine, and I uh, like more or less uh, Merlot type or even darker uh, Terran uh, or something like that. Yeah, to, to add on to what Luca's saying, the, the the mushroom not to pair with wine with the inky caps, that they actually um, there's a chemical in one of the inky caps that they've abstracted and helped use as a treatment for people um, with you know alcoholism. And so when you like actually when you eat this mushroom and if you drink alcohol, you'll feel sick, but only if you drink alcohol. Um, and this is specifically for, you know, I think it's like Caprinus something in that genus. But so yeah, that's the Caprinus tomatoes or something like that, yeah. Yeah, or that's the, the one, one. I know not that to pair. Yeah. The, yeah. the other pairings are all probably fun and, and, and good, but they, it's actually interesting that they have used this for, um, for you know, purposes to do with, with helping people with alcoholism. That's really cool. Um, we've got another question from Marianne. What kinds of uh, mushrooms, Miro, do you grow on your farm? Can you tell us a little bit more about all the different varieties that we were seeing in your tour? Yes, what you were seeing in a tour is majority of it is uh, oyster mushrooms. So basically there was king blue oyster, phoenix oyster, elm oyster, and I had some heritium, lion's mane. So those four kinds were there in the video. But I do grow more different kinds of oyster mushrooms, such as pink oyster and yellow oyster, which are usually grown in summertime because they love the heat. Um, also, there are king, king oysters too, and a variety between king and elm oyster called blue pearl kings. Sometimes I introduce them throughout the year when the weather permits. Um, I do grow uh, chestnut mushrooms too. They, they're a little bit more difficult to grow, so there's not, there's not much um, in my room right now. But when I grow them, I try not to grow too much of it because because of that difficulty. Cool. We have one last question here. For the bags, the cultivated mushrooms, you were talking about the first flush, the second flush. How many um, flushes will the bag produce? Or is it, does it have like a finite lifespan or does it continue to grow with maintenance? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, bag can produce five or six flushes, to be honest with you, as long as it doesn't get contaminated. Usually when I sell a bag to people, I tell them first and second flush are the biggest. Uh, it continues to produce on third, fourth, and fifth, sometimes even more. I had lion's mane producing even on sixth or seventh flush, but every time uh, fruit comes for a next flush, it's smaller. Reason being the food is being greatly used from the bag. Um, sometimes uh, contamination happens where you need to throw the bag away, but it's not, it's not often if conditions are right. Okay, and then this will be our last question and then we're going to start to wrap up. Last question here is, Miro again, what temperature and humidity um, do you keep your fruiting chamber at? Fruiting chamber, I personally keep it at between 65 and 85 percent of humidity and that's controlled by um by a special system that creates that humidity and i introduced it with certain fan into my chamber and the temperature is usually around 65. now uh throughout the winter time in when it's very cold and throughout the summer when it's a lot of heat i adjust it a little bit but basically it's around 65 fahrenheit Okay, awesome. And for those people who are interested in purchasing your mushrooms, where can they find you at? Um, I, there, there are informations on the video, and uh, basically there's my phone number and email, and they can always send me an email and even call me and send me a text message. Great. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you again. A huge, sincere thank you to M. Luca, Miro, for all the work that you've done to pull this presentation together. We've learned so much today, and it's been really fun chatting with you guys about mushrooms. All right. Um, one note here, if you'd like to revisit or share this presentation, you will be able to find this 
uh, recording on our Facebook and YouTube channels, please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll be having live events all week long, um, also posted to Facebook as well. And you can always find the stream on clevelandcarantavania.com and then hit the watch live presentations button and that'll get you to the stream as well. Before we conclude, I'd like to let you know that we have about 15 additional programs and events scheduled for this upcoming week. So we hope that you will be able to join us again soon. You can find all the details for these events on our website, clevelandcarantavania.com. Please do be aware that a free registration is required for a few of these events, particularly the movie night, so that we can get you the link to those films. Thank you to the generous support of our sponsors, partners, volunteers, and you, our participants. Through your generous donations, all of our events are free. We couldn't do this without those those who support us, so thank you to all who have made this possible. Uh, Cleveland Crentavania is again a nonprofit volunteer organized event, and if you'd like to support us in bringing more programming like this to you, please consider our donation. You can donate directly through our website or by texting current 21 K U R E N T 21 to the number. 44321. Again, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We had a really great time. I hope we'll see you again soon this week. Um, consider joining us again today at 3 o'clock Eastern Time for our next event we, where we will be live at Collision Bend Brewery here in Cleveland, Ohio, speaking with Chef Andy uh, Dombrowski, followed by a baking demonstration of Kremschnata with Spiele Vodic, author of Cook Eat Slovenia Cookbook, uh, who will be coming to us live from Slovenia. Again, that's today, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you, everybody. Again, adio.